what we do here is go back, 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 back. Hi, and welcome to Mr. Toyama's AP World History. This is Chapter 14, The Resurgence of Empire in East Asia. Here's our intro. After the fall of the Han Dynasty, more than 350 years of disruption plagued China. Toward the end of the 6th century, centralized imperial rule returned to China and Paris persisted for almost 700 years under the Sui, Tang, and Song dynasties, 589 to 1279 CE. This period witnessed unprecedented economic prosperity for China. In addition, China, as the Middle Kingdom, made its influence felt through the surrounding territories, creating a larger East Asian society centered on China. This period of East Asian history is characterized by the following. Number one, rapid economic development because of more advanced agricultural practices, technological and industrial innovations, and participation in sophisticated trade networks throughout East Asia and including the revived Silk Roads. Number two, the spread of Buddhism beyond its place of origin in India until it became the most popular religious faith in all of East Asia. And number three, the profound influence of Chinese social organization and economic dynamism of the surrounding cultures of Korea, Vietnam, Japan, and Central Asia. All right, before we begin, uh, if you'd like, you can turn your paper sideways, and what uh, you can do is draw three big columns. Uh, kind of, we're going to start talking about uh, post-classical Chinese dynasties, the first three that come up, specifically the Sui, that's how you say S-U-I, the Tang, or Tang dynasty, and the Song dynasty. Uh, I know it sounds kind of weird, but that's how it is in China. Uh, on the back of your paper, I'd like you to write the post-classical development, development of complex societies in East and Southeast Asia. We're going to talk about how Korea was affected, Vietnam, and Japan, specifically the early and medieval stages. All right, so here is a uh, map showing the Sui and Tang dynasties in 589 to 7, 907 CE. You can see in green we have the Tang uh, Empire, we have overlaid in the lines, uh, we have the Sui uh, Empire, we have the Silla Kingdom, which isn't very prominent here on our map. We have defensive walls that are being put up to keep out the Uyghurs in the north, and uh, a Grand Canal, which we're going to start off with. First, we start off with the Sui Dynasty, 589 to 618 CE. Regional kingdoms follow the collapse of the Han Dynasty, so the Han falls apart, and there's a power vacuum that uh, takes place. Uh, what follows is uh, the Sui dynasty, led by a man named Yang Jian, uh, consolidates control of all of China and initiates the Sui dynasty. Uh, he institutes massive building projects, uh, different walls, some city stuff. Uh, most importantly, we're going to talk about the Grand Canal. Uh, he uses military labor, but also this concept of conscripted labor. Conscripted labor is basically the idea that uh, pretend you're in a village, and uh, one day you're farming and doing your villager thing, and uh, an imperial man comes from the court of the emperor and says uh, to all the people they need to assemble, they assemble, and there he reads a scroll that says, all right, everybody who is a subject of the emperor, which means all y'all, what you need to do is you need to give up your farm for a little while and your home, and you need to follow me, and there's going to be a military... Uh, escort that comes along in a couple weeks probably and we're going to take you to start building some stuff you're going to do this in support of our great dynasty that we're building and you won't get paid for it but you'll get the reap the benefits of it so just be prepared that you're going to probably go for a year a couple months just depends on what it is and you would be taken care of on the way there and then when you're all done you're released and a new group of people would be brought in to take over the building of that project this uh starts kind of some resentment if you think about it you would not be very happy if someone came along and said to you hey you need to give up everything you need to go work for two years on a giant building construction site you would be a little upset so it's not starting off very well for those within the sway uh dynasty their economic and social prospects however what comes of it is the grand canal it's intended to promote trade between north and south china most Chinese rivers flow west to east, which allows for some good trade and commerce, but it only moves in two directions, whereas China has a very large population of uh, farms in the north and needs it to move a lot of those goods to the south. And so having this north-south uh, Grand Canal being built, or giant man-made river, it's made to uh, facilitate trade that's going to support the Sui dynasty. It's a linked network of earlier canals. Smaller canals were built before that and it kind of completes the whole uh, building of that canal through this process. At the end, it's about 2,000 kilometers, uh, 1,240 miles, 
and there were roads on either bank. So in addition to having some boats that were able to move north and south, you also have the uh, ability to move goods along roads uh, adjacent to that Grand Canal. It's a great work, uh, one of the largest uh, man-made uh, canals to this day, and it's something that improves the economic prospects of China early on during this period. We then get to the Tang Dynasty, uh, 618 to 907 CE. There was wide con discontent over conscripted labor in the Sui Dynasty. If you think about it, uh, you can only force people to work for so long before they start to realize that this isn't really benefiting them. Using your peasants and using your people as a ruler, uh, is, as slaves, is not a really good plan in the long term. So uh, people start to kind of push back. There are also some military failures in Korea that are prom prompting some rebellions by the military leaders. And the emperor is eventually assassinated in 618 CE, and the Tang dynasty is initiated. Next, we get Tang Taizong. He's the second emperor of the Tang dynasty. Uh, he rules from 627 to 649 CE. He murdered his two brothers and then thrust his father aside to take his throne. Uh, he, however, being very ruthless, was known as a strong ru ruler. He built his capital Chang, uh, which is going to become a very central part of early Chinese dynasties as an imperial city. Uh, he brings about law and order. He's known as uh, possibly ending banditry in one account throughout his uh, reign, meaning that people weren't getting robbed and bandits were severely punished. Taxes and prices were low under his administration, and he had more infect effective implementation of earlier sway policies, specifically civil service examinations and civil service administration. Uh, this is something that gives you some hope if you're a peasant. For example, if you were born as a peasant and your family had no money, but you were able to go off to some schooling, maybe learn a little bit, and then you were able to be a court recorder or some sort of bureaucrat within the uh, Tang dynasty, then what you would be able to do is improve your economic outlook and, ask, and prospects going forward so that your future generations might have it better and better and better. And also your life would have been improved as a result of this. This gave you hope, didn't make you want to rebel so much because the system was really working for you. There are three major achievements of the Tang dynasty. It's implemented in the Sui, but applied more effectively in the Tang. Number one, transportation and communications. They created an extensive postal and courier services to move information throughout the empire very quickly and efficiently. Number two, there's this equal field system. We're gonna kind of look at how uh, in world history, People in government distribute and redistribute land to the people that need it the most. Is it really the job of the government to support those that have need of land, or is it the job of the government to support those who have acquired land? So, for example, if you're a rich landowner, as we've talked about in the past, is it your duty to take care of that land, administer the land properly, and employ peasants? Or is it the job of the government to make sure that all people have an equal opportunity at receiving land in a way that they can find the most useful? And which one would support your government and your philosophy uh, going forward? We're going to talk about this multiple times throughout world history, so kind of keep an eye out for how governments distribute land. Well, with the equal field system, 20% of the land is hereditary in ownership, meaning that 20% uh, of your land that is set up during this time can be moved from father to son or within the family. Uh, 80% is redistributed according to a formula, specifically fa land, family size and land fertility. If, let's say, you were a farmer and you were kind of a poor farmer, let's say you had six kids and you also had a couple brothers and maybe some wives, for one for each of you, what would end up happening is you would oftentimes have not enough land to take care of all the people that you need to take care of. But through this new equal healed system, what's nice is that your family size and the uh, actual fertility of the land itself would be taken into account in whether you would get more land or less land. One of the important things that uh, really affects this is that as a peasant, you would feel that the government was really watching out for you. You would feel that this process would uh, keep those who had acquired land the ability to keep acquiring land because they still would keep 20% of that land. And it would also encourage those who are rich to have more children and to um, really improve the land fertility as it uh, was being used. If you were a small, poor farmer, as in the example I gave before, you would be given a chance to have a very large land holding, maybe, that didn't have a 
a lot of fertility to it, or you would be given a smaller plot with lots of land fertility that was able to grow lots of um, food for you, yourself, and your family, and maybe even allow you to do some trade. This works well into the 8th century. There was corruption and specifically the loss of land to Buddhist monasteries. As Buddhism infiltrates China, it starts to change the way that people distribute land and what they do with the land that they hold on to themselves. Number three, bureaucracy of merit, imperial service, service examinations. There was a Confucian educational curriculum. Again, back to those schools, if you were somebody who studied well and learned Chinese and how to write, you probably also would have learned specifically Confucian uh, ideals. And this basically sets up this long-term uh, dichotomy. How should people really interact with the government? How should uh, rulers and administrators uh, interact with the people? We talked about in the past some of the uh, schools of Chinese thought, specifically like legalism, Taoism, uh, Confucianism. And through the Confucian educational uh, curriculum, it kind of supports government overall. It, it says to keep things the same, make sure that people are happy, make sure that uh, you're a good person, uh, respect the elders, keep, know your place in society. If you're a bureaucrat, do your bureaucrat thing. Don't really try and rise above your station. Make sure that you're just doing your job really well. There was edu educational opportunity. It was widely available. It built loyalty to the dynasty because, again, if it's working well for you, then you're probably going to support it. And the system remained strong until the early 20th century even. There is next uh, Taong military expansion and foreign relations. And specifically the area of Manchuria, Korea, Vietnam, and Tibet one of the largest expansions of China in its history, they established tributary relationships, specifically gifts. Now, tributary relationships we've seen before in the place of Rome, where as long as you paid your taxes or you gave gifts to the empire, Rome kind of left you alone, let you do your thing, let you have your administrators. Well, this tributary relationship works really well because this gift shows, A, that you are willing to be subservient to the larger middle kingdom known as China at this time, and it also supports um, some of the... Uh, economic outlook of China as it's able to kind of glean off some of the goods and wealth of the nations around it. Well, specifically areas around it, not nations. China is known as the Middle Kingdom, ruling over the kingdom surrounding it. And they institute one of these uh, very specific rituals known as the Kowtow Ritual that shows subservience to the uh, emperors of China. What you would do is you would basically get uh, in front of the emperor, bow on your knees, and you would place your head to the ground three separate times. So you'd do three sets of kneelings and nine knockings of the head on the ground. And usually it would accompany some sort of mantra or ritual of, of allegiance to the emperor or worship of the emperor. And so this process showed your uh, willingness to be subservient to the emperor. And it also recognized the emperor's uh, prominence over your specific country or your specific region or your specific king that ruled your area as subservient to the emperor of China. The Tang decline. There's governmental neglect. Uh, the emperor becomes obsessed with music and his favorite concubine or court prostitute. In 775 CE, there was a rebellion under An Lushan, former military commander. He captures Chang, but rebellion is crushed by 763. Uh, basically what ends up happening is the Tong invite nomadic Uyghurs, mercenaries, to suppress the rebellion there in the northwest region of China. And uh, as a result of helping to suppress this rebellion, they ask to sack or take uh, whatever they want and pill rape and pillage all of Chang and Luoyang. Uh, the Tang decline continues. There's rebellions in the 9th century, and the last emperor abdicates or gives up the throne in 907. Uh, specifically during this time, there was a man named Huang Chao. He had his campaigns for about 10 years. He was a military commander. And what's interesting about him is he kind of uh, personifies some of the problems that's wrong with the Tang dynasty. He takes land from the rich and gives it back to the poor. And this uh, kind of incites a popular support for him and his rebellion. That's why it was able to last for so long. Uh, Huang Chao is a military leader and a long line of military leaders that we'll study in world history of people who see not only economic prosperity by being able to take from the rich and giving to the poor, but also getting a social and um, a religious, not religious, uh, what's the word, uh, so a social support structure from the peasantry that engenders in them a, a love for Huang Chao because he's righting the wrongs. He's almost like a Robin Hood character that we would understand from the West. And through this process, uh, basically the Tong is never able to really recover. Uh, then we get to the, the Saong dynasty. 
in 960 to 1279 CE, there's an emphasis on administration, industry, education, and the arts. This is a shift away from the previous two dynasties as the military is not emphasized. One of the big things that you can kind of start to pick out as a pattern in world history is that when militarism is promoted throughout an empire or a region or a country, uh, it's very difficult to maintain if you keep forcing the military to grow and grow and expand its territory. Military uh, leaders oftentimes see themselves as not only invaluable, but also less and less in need of governmental structure, governmental bureaucrats, as they are the ones doing most of the work. Through the Sa'ong dynasty, however, there's an emphasis on the structures of government, on how to support the local industry, on educating those within these uh, lower social classes, and also the arts. So this military emphasis being de-emphasized is uh, creating within this culture a like more rounded, if you would like to call it, uh, support of what is happening within China as a whole. It's under the direction of the first emperor Song Taizu. He reigns from 960 to 976 CE. He was a former military leader, uh, but he was made emperor by his troops, and he instituted a policy of imperial favor for civil servants and expanded the meritocracy. Being a military leader, I feel like he kind of knew what probably a lot of us in historians can kind of understand is that with the military being closely linked with the government, it can be very difficult sometimes to rein in the military as they are the ones with the swords, the guns, the violence. And as a former military leader who was made emperor by his troops, he was seen as a, a very popular figure. But at the same time, he gains imperial favor specifically from the peasantry and from the middle classes or the other groups outside of the military because of the civil servant um, emphasis and expansion of meritocracy or the belief that the more you learn, the more you go to school, the more you are loyal to the government, the more support and value you are to the government. Here's the Song Dynasty. It's in uh, like the outline of purple, so it's not. It's both uh, what we would cover the Jin Empire and the Southern Song Dynasty, and the Grand Canal running through it. You can see it runs north and south and kind of splits off at one point. Uh, yeah, so the Song Dynasty reigns from 960 to 1279 CE again, and it's it encompasses a large section of what we call today Eastern China. There were two Song weaknesses, however. Number one was the size of bureaucracy with heavy drain on the economy. Uh, with the size of the bureaucracy, they were the ones who received more of the support, the imperial favor, and as a result, peasants saw themselves increasingly as being uh, an afterthought in the structure of the government or within the society as a whole. There's initial inertia presents the reform of internal inertia prevents the reform of bureaucracy. Uh, what happens is, if you're a bureaucrat working within the government, you're not really somebody who wants reform, because you're not going to see this system working for you if you're willing to say, "Hey guys, I think that we get paid too much," or "Hey guys, I think our lives are too easy. We need to share some with the peasants." So, this uh, internal inertia or slowness to move prevents reform of the bureaucracy leading to those peasant rebellions in the 12th century. And number two, the civil service leadership of the military. As a civil servant, uh, you would have had very little training in military affairs, but you would have been in charge if you were specific types of bureaucrats in military matters. Lacking that military training, you're unable to contain nomadic attacks, under, unable to understand military strategy, military tactics, as those commanders on the field of battle would probably have known. And the Gherkin conquer and forced the Song dynasty to Huangzu, which is in southern China, forcing them into southern Song. Uh, agricultural economies of the Tang and Song dynasty. They developed uh, Vietnamese fast ripening rice. They developed two crops per year. This goes back to one of our big truths of world history. The more food you have or the more calories you're able to create, the more likely you are to increase your uh, size of your peoples. But if you are only able to grow rice once a year, you're only going to be able to make so much food per year. However, developing this Vietnamese fast ripening rice and having two crops per year, you're basically doubling your crop output, meaning that you're going to increase your calorie intake, increasing your people as a whole. Uh, there also is a uh, emphasis on technology. They get iron plows and the use of draft animals to help to cultivate the land. There is soil fertilization and improved irrigation. Uh, we have talked about in the past how soil can be exhausted through process of over uh, use of farmland but soil fertilization puts nutrients back into the soil, and improved irrigation allows for water to not be wasted as it is moved into fields. Uh, water wheels, for example, canals are being used, and eventually the idea of terrace farming. I found this little video on Wikipedia, which I find to be very interesting. It's uh, two people in modern day China still doing terrace farming,
Now what's interesting here is you can kind of see that these people are farming on the side of a hill. If you think about rain and how rain works or even how water works, it's not going to be very beneficial if you are farming on the side of a hill. China being a very hilly country, you're going to need to find a new way of interacting with the land. Thus, terrace farming. Terrace farming looks like this. Being able to create steps within the land itself allows for water to pool. And pooling water when it comes down through rivers or is uh, diverted through canals or through rain is able to pool within certain areas, allowing the water to stand or stop moving down the hill. It does a couple things. Number one, it stops the washing away of crops and it also allows the water to actually soak down into the soil to the roots where the plants will drink up the water. This invention of terrace farming allows for better crop yields, allows for crops to be um, planted in places that traditionally could not be used as farmland, specifically flatland, but now hillsides are even used for farming. Population growth, going back to that big truth of world history, results of increased agricultural production means increase in people. Effective food distribution system, they're able to spread the food out effectively and efficiently, allowing through the transportation networks built under the Tang, Tang and Sang dynasties, the ability to move food to people where it's needed the most. As you can see from 600 CE, there was about 30 to 40 million uh, Chinese. By about 1200 CE, there is close to 120 million Chinese. Urbanization. Chang becomes the world's most populous city at 2 million residents. This is from economic prosperity, but also from agricultural prosperity that is being able to efficiently move through the country. Southern Sa'ang capital and Hengshui was over 1 million people at this time. There were patriarchal social structures, increased emphasis on ancestor worship. During this time, there's a shift to more of uh, veneration of ancestors. Before in the past, you would basically worship or um, venerate your ancestors in your home, in small rituals, maybe even private rituals. This transitions into elaborate grave rituals with extended family and larger families going out to even trace back farther and farther their ancestors and venerating them at gravesides and in cemeteries. Uh, extended family gatherings in honor of deceased ancestors. Again, going back to some of the older traditions of the Chinese that uh, was emphasized under Confucius as veneration of ancestors. Just because they're dead does not mean we should not venerate them. Foot binding also gains popularity. Foot binding is a very strange thing to me. What you do basically is you take young girls when they're born and you basically start to wrap their feet with um, silk. It's, it's something that doesn't hurt the foot necessarily, but over time it deforms the foot and you're able to actually fold the feet into um, basically like a point. Think like a um, ballet shoe and the toes are able to fold under and basically it, the foot becomes deformed through this forcing of um, tying of the foot and when as it grows the bones kind of are misshapen at certain points women are not even able to walk without the assistance of canes and in some cases women were having to actually be carried uh, by servants this is an increased pr control by male family members if uh, sadly a woman cannot move on her own or run on her own she has no choice in a lot of matters so this foot binding popularity is an effort to kind of control women and control how women are uh, moving throughout the society at large at this time however there's one kind of standout we have Wu Zhao from uh, 626 to 706 CE, she is the only woman in Chinese history to claim the imperial title and rule as an emperor without the support of a male emperor uh, in front of her. She ran afoul of Confucian scholars. She patronized the Buddhist monks uh, who wrote texts legitimizing her rule, saying that women were uh, valuable and just as able to rule. She fought rebellions. She had secret police to crush uprisings, and she strengthened the civil service system to prevent aristocratic challenges to her authority. If you think about it, one of the things that uh, Wu Zhao has by using the civil service system, you again go back to this idea that you are uh, supporting a structure within the society to not rebel. If you were somebody who was outside of the system of the um, upper class, you would see the civil service system as something that you could climb, something you could be a part of, rather than you're stuck being where you're born. Wu Zhao's uh, emphasis on strengthening the civil service system uh, basically legitimizes her reign among the people, allowing them to kind of support her rule, and it keeps the aristocratic challenges or the others who are within her social class from taking her throne. She only eventually gives up the throne at the age of 80 to her son, but she is, one, she is still to this day the only woman in Chinese history to rule as the emperor. 
very strange kind of one-off within this time period in world history of a woman being a sole uh, regional ruler. Next, we have technology and industry. Porcelain, or Chinaware, as we call it today, China, uh, has an increase in iron production due to the use of coke, not cocaine. It is a specific chemical here on the left. It burns at a lot higher uh, temperature, and it's used in furnaces. It burns longer. It's able to help make agricultural tools and weaponry, and the Chinese are actually able to invent gunpowder, which is going to be used in different uh, methods, specifically the eventual use in the creation of guns. Earlier printing techniques are refined. It's not 100% sure when a printed text starts to show up in world history, but we know they have movable type by the mid-11th century. Yet complex Chinese ideographs make woodblock technique easier. Because you don't need as many symbols in language uh, within Chinese, you don't need to have as many movable type. If you think about the word, for example, apple in English, A-P-P-L-E, that oftentimes takes five letters to explain or spell out within movable type, especially when we get to the printing press. Whereas in Chinese ideographs, because the Chinese can use symbols, specifically one specific symbol with a couple strokes on one specific block, the word like apple can be represented by one specific block and one specific symbol. This is one versus five, meaning that dissemination of information is faster and the ability to uh, effectively and efficiently move type is uh, increase. They also have naval technology. Uh, they invent what's known as the south pointing needle or a compass. They waterproof their ships with some oil. They have rudders and they use canvas sails during this time. All amazing techniques that naval technology would not be able to advance without. Next we have the emergence of a market economy. Letters of credit develop as a way to deal with copper coin shortages. Copper being a metal that's found in the ground is not always easily refined and created, and as copper was being uh, created and used for coins, eventually there's a shortage, and they eventually move on to what is known as letters of credit to deal with paper coin. What that would mean is a piece of paper would be given out by banks or by uh, the imperial government saying that we owe you 100 coins of copper, bring this back in like six months and we'll give you the, the, cops, the coins of copper, we just don't have it right now. Promissory notes, that same specifically IOUs, and checks were also used, meaning you could take, for example, receiving of goods as an imperial power and write a check to someone for their goods, and then they could take that to another place and get the coins in exchange for that paper money, or excuse me, that check. Development of independently produced paper money, it's uh, one of the rare times in world history where people outside of the government basically produce their own paper money. It's it's kind of strange as you think about money. Money is basically just an IOU for goods. When you go to the store and you buy a cheeseburger at McDonald's and you give them $5 for your cheeseburger, what you're basically saying is I have done labor and now I have this piece of paper that says that I am entitled to $5 worth of my labor in goods or services that you may be offering. And so I'm going to give you five dollars worth of that labor and in exchange you're going to give me a good or a service and specifically in this example mcdonald's cheeseburgers but as people independently produce this paper money outside of the government many times people don't always recognize this paper money so let's say you went to one trader with your rice and you trade him 100 pounds of rice and he gives you a credit of independently produced paper money saying that yes you gave me 100 pounds of rice here's like 20 paper money symbols and then you go to try and buy some oxen or something from your neighbor, well, he might not recognize that paper money, and then basically you have worthless pieces of paper. This process leads to a non-stable economy, and riots ensue when it's not honored. The government finally claims a monopoly on the money production in the 11th century, outlawing all uh, independently produced paper money, meaning that the money that can be traded can only come from the government, and it has to be standardized. We'll talk about that a little more as we move on to economic theory in later chapters. China and the hemispheric economy. We talked about hemispheric trading zones and how basically one group was able to dominate a certain area of the hemisphere and uh, kind of support the structures of a hemispheric economy. Increasingly, the cosmopolitan nature of Chinese cities uh, kind of lead to a need to increase larger uh, economic trading zones. Chinese silk opens up trade routes but increases for local demands for imported luxury goods. The Chinese trade away the silk and the porcelain and some of the other goods that China is known for 
And as the local population demand imported luxury goods outside of China, this improves the routes of what will eventually be the reestablished Silk Roads that kind of fell into disrepair a little bit before this time. There is cultural change in the Tang and Sa'ang China, declining confidence in Confucianism after the collapse of the Han Dynasty. Again, going back to Confucianism, if you're one of those people who saw the uh, emperor, or excuse me, the philosopher Confucius's ideas as being a little outdated, because if you're trying to stay within a, soul, a culture and a society that tells you to know your place, but everyone else is doing whatever they feel like and you're not getting ahead, you're going to kind of fall away from some of those ideas because you're going to say that it's not working for you. Philosophies only work if they make sense to you and they work for you. Increasingly, there's popularity of Buddhism. Again, going back to the idea that this life does not matter, and it doesn't really matter who's in charge, but there is an emphasis eventually on salvation, personal salvation. You can get out of this life, death, birth, recycle uh, of your uh, trying to work out your salvation. And what you need to do is follow the uh, Noble Eightfold Path and the Four Noble Truths. And what you'll eventually do is reach nirvana or enlightenment away from this life. These... Uh, Tenants also are something that appeals uh, in other religions to the Chinese, specifically Christianity, Manichaeanism, Zoroastrianism, and Islam, all of which emphasize a personal salvation, a salvation that allows you, after this life, to live a happier life separate from this world. The clientele is primarily a foreign merchant class because they are bringing in these ideas, again, going back to the big truths of world history that not everything is traded on trade routes is just goods. Dunhuang is uh, someone we're going to talk about next, uh, or excuse me, a place that we're going to talk about next. Mahayana Buddhism is especially popular in Western China in the Gansu province from 600 to 1000 CE. Basically, Mahayana is known as the greater vehicle. It's separate from older forms of Buddhism because if you think about Buddhism, the story basically goes that the Buddha discontent with his life, decides to try and find enlightenment. So he travels around and le learns to find the middle path or the, the path of least extremes. He focuses on meditation. He focuses on silence. And one of his big uh, ideas is that you don't really need a lot. You need a bowl, you need a robe, and you need to kind of meditate and just kind of try and empty yourself of desire. Well, Mahayana argues that there's some things that you might need to do. Maybe some chanting, maybe some ritual to your uh, Buddhism. Maybe you need to uh, teach others and kind of practice what you preach. In the original school of Buddhism, the Buddha really doesn't teach very many people and really doesn't interact with anyone until after reaching enlightenment. And then he begins to try and bring others into the enlightenment. In the Mahayana school, the belief is that uh, you, we all know the goal in Buddhism that we want to reach enlightenment. So your job as a Mahayana Buddhist is to try and teach others, which will actually get you some credit in the ending of suffering because what you're doing is you're trying to alleviate your personal suffering by promulgating or promoting the ideas of the Buddha and you're supporting your long-term enlightenment because you're, you're trying to enlighten others. And that's like good karma as you go forward. You're giving out good vibes and good information to try and help others. And by doing that... What you're doing is uh, basically freeing yourself from this life and from this world. Economic success as converts donate land holdings. One of the big things in Buddhism is if you're trying to eliminate desire and desire only comes from want of stuff, well, you don't need to get as much land. So maybe if you were a recent convert to Buddhism and you were very rich, what you might do is become a monk and give up all your land to a monastery. This would do a couple things. Number one, it would get you some good spiritual credit because you're getting rid of that desire and that suffering like chain. You also are being able to help your community as a whole and you're able to help others because the monks can then distribute the food to the peasants who are starving. And basically, uh, you can get some good vibes going through the community because now uh, there's more food and land for the people as they all hopefully start to practice more of what the Buddha was teaching. Uh, it is increasingly popular through donations of agricultural produce to the poor. If you were a poor peasant and you heard about the rich guy who lived in your town as giving up everything and living as a monk and shaving his head and having a bowl and a robe and giving up all his possessions, you would think, okay, that's, that's weird. But one of the things you would kind of focus on is that now that all his land is given to the monastery, the monks seem to farm a lot and then give out the food for free. And then they just want to talk to us about 
uh, the life, death, rebirth thing. And it would start to sound kind of appealing because ooh, it would start to sound kind of appealing because it would seem like what you need is to follow the path of the rich guy. If the rich guy is doing it and the monks seem to be pretty happy and everything seems to be vibing pretty well, maybe I need to join this cool religion that's helping out uh, me and my family. Next, we have conflicts within Chinese culture. If you think about the core of Buddhism versus the core of Confucianism, there's a couple problems. Number one, in Buddhism, it's text-based. It's based on the Buddhist teachings from India. In Confucianism, it's also text-based, but it's conf it is purely Chinese coming from Confucius within its teaching. In Buddhism, there's an emphasis on metaphysics, meaning the spiritual realm, the life-after-death realm, the dying well, the living well uh, process, and how you get spiritual strength or spiritual value from your actions. Uh, there's also Taoism on the other side that's not text-based. And on the Confucianist side, there's an emphasis on ethics and politics. They don't really focus so much on the afterlife. Uh, they don't really focus on good karma. They don't focus on anything that has to do with really good um, spirituality. What it focuses on is what's the right action, what is the right action for our society, what is the right way to act within the society, and how should a government govern. In Buddhism, they have the ascetic ideal, which means celibacy or living alone and not having sex with anyone, not even your wives, and even if you're married, you might not even be married after this, and also isolation, going off, meditating, being by yourself, doing your rituals, uh, maybe chanting, but you're separate. You're kind of by yourself. You can go times without even talking. Whereas in Confucianism, it's very family-centered. It's focused on procreation. You have to continue the lineage. You have to respect the elders, and the way to respect the elders is to create youngers who will then respect the elders, and then eventually you'll be the elders, and then they will respect you, and so on and so forth. And then also filial piety, uh, allegiance to your family. In Buddhism, your family is kind of not a thing. It's just the group of people who you got sent to be with for this lifetime. In the next lifetime, you won't have them, so you don't really need to worry about them. But in Confucianism, your family is everything because that is the way the structure works. You need to respect those who are in your family because they're the ones who brought you about. They're the ones who fed you when you were like a baby and couldn't feed yourself. And you need to respect them and take care of them as they get older and as you get older because that's just the way Confucius taught it. There are schools of Buddhism. Uh, the Buddhists adapt ideology to Chinese climate. The Dharma gets translated as Tao. We talked about that before. Nirvana is translated as Wu Wei. You watched some videos on that in previous lectures. It accommodated to the family lifestyle. What ends up happening is there's a saying that develops amongst Buddhists in China and says, one son in the monastery for 10 generations of salvation, meaning that uh, we don't want everybody to just give up everything and destroy our society and just become monks. Instead, here's what we'll do. The Buddhists encourage families to give one son. He's going to be like the religious monk person, and his job is to go and do the enlightenment thing. And he'll come back and teach you guys stuff, and he'll kind of be doing the, so, the spiritual work for your family, and he's, you're, you guys are like good for 10 generations, meaning that you get some like residual karma as a result of what he's doing. Uh, this is eventually used in the Chan school and Zen Buddhism. They're really focused on uh, kind of having this belief that the, the Buddha was awesome and he was great, but there's also some other bodhisattvas or saints that we need to look to and let's look at their paths and how they got enlightenment and we need to kind of follow that. And some of them didn't do it the same way the Buddha did, which was sitting under a Bodhi tree. Instead, some of them did some chanting. So maybe we need to do some chanting. And some of them did some like ritual things. And so, so maybe we need to do some ritual things. So it's kind of like find your own path Buddhism. Uh, then there's also the Pure Land School of Buddhism. Uh, this was promoted by the Empress uh, that we talked about a little bit er earlier. She really focuses on the emphasis that like sometimes there's like this like flash of enlightenment. There's a flash of understanding that kind of comes to you like thunder. And what's great about it is it doesn't really rely on like tons and tons of time of meditation. It can sometimes just come to you in your process of doing your rituals or in the process of doing your uh, religious uh, stuff. And it, it really seems to kind of blend this Chinese culture of like work and duty, but also of salvation. There is some persecution of Buddhists. The Taoist and Confucian persecution is supported in late Tang Dynasty. In the 18, 840s, there begins a systematic closure of Buddhist temples and expulsions of Buddhist people. Zoroastrians, Christians, and Manichaeans as well. 
there's an economic motive to this process, basically the seizure of large monastic land holdings. The, the Buddhist monasteries and the Buddhist monks become a very powerful force within Chinese culture because they are able to hold large swaths of land. This is a time when land means everything because agriculture means food, food means not dying, and not dying means you have lots of power over people to help them uh, not die. And so by having the persecution of the Buddhists and kicking expulsion of the Buddhist monks and uh, destruction of Buddhist temples, you're basically taking back the land for the government and uh, reasserting power as a governmental structure. Next we get Neo-Confucianism. Under the Song Dynasty, it refrains from persecuting Buddhists, but it just conf it favors some Confucianists. There is then a Neo-Confucian thought that is influenced by Buddhist thought. Uh, Confucianism is interesting because what it does is it emphasizes a structure of ethics and politics. But the Confucianists, specifically the Neo-Confucianists, see a value in the other aspects that it doesn't have in Buddhism, the spiritual and the metaphysical. And so there's this kind of uh, syncretism or blending of some ideas from Buddhism, and this is basically promulgated by Zhu Shi, who lives uh, between 1130 to 1200 CE, pictured here. China and Korea. Now we're on the back side of your paper. The Silla Dynasty. Tang armies withdraw, and Korea recognizes the Tang as emperor, doing that whole vassal state system. Technically a vassal state, but highly independent. They would give their gifts, but they kind of did their own thing. The Chinese, however, do influence culture, Korean culture in the ways like they are very... Uh, used to Chinese stories, Chinese language, Chinese uh, religious influences in the form of Confucianism and Buddhism, and it starts to basically look like Korea is just like a mini China during this time. China and Vietnam. The Vietnamese adaption to Chinese culture and technology. They see what China is doing as the Middle Kingdom, and they believe that they can get on the bandwagon of Chinese awesomeness, but ongoing resentment at political domination. The Vietnamese basically uh, slowly start to see the Chinese as, as owners rather than a middle kingdom of support like a vassal state. They assert independence when the Ta'ong dynasty falls in the 10th century. We'll come back to Vietnam a little later. China and early Japan. Chinese armies never invade Japan, yet Chinese culture is pervasive. They imitate the Tang administration, or the Ta'ong administration. There is the establishment of a new capital at Nara, the city of Nara, hence Nara, Japan, which is around from 710 to 794 CE. They adopt Confucian Buddhist teachings, yet they also retain Shinto religion, which has aspects of ancestor veneration and also some spirits and deities kind of running around in the forests. Uh, Shintoism is a wholly Japanese religion in that it has to do with uh, some of the Chinese ideas of ancestor veneration, but it also adds the aspect of like uh, kami, like divine like winds living in the forest that are like tricksters and might hurt you. They're kind of like gods. Here is the borderlands of post-classical China, Korea, Vietnam, and Japan. We can see uh, in pink we have the Silla Kingdom, and in green we have the Nara State, which only occupies the south uh, part of Japan during this time with its capital at Nara. Then we get to Hien, Japan, or sorry, Haiyan. Uh, Japanese emperor moves the court to Haiyan, or Kyoto. Yet the emperor is just a figurehead. The real power is in the hands of the Fujiwara clan. This is the start of a Japanese tradition of having the emperor just being some dude that sits on a throne far away from where all the real decisions are being made. The real power in the government is in the Fujiwara clan. Uh, there is a weak emperor, power behind the throne. That's the pattern of Japanese history. It helps explain the longevity of the institution. If you were an emperor, you don't really pose a lot of influence or threat to what's going on in the government. The emperor was basically just a guy who sat on a throne, did his royal duties, but he wasn't making decisions, wasn't passing laws, wasn't collecting taxes, lived in a big palace, made the made uh, his servants do some stuff for him. But uh, if you were somebody who really was into ruling stuff, you might kind of like the idea of the emperor just being the emperor because you always kind of have that legitimacy thing that the people kind of respect. Yes, the emperor is in charge, but in reality, the Fujiwara clan during uh, the Haiyan period is really running the show. And as long as you can kind of deal with the fact the emperor is supposed to be a god and just doing his thing far away, you get to be in charge and do whatever you want. Next, we have Japanese literature. There's an influence of Chinese kanji characters. Uh, Basically, that 
Japanese style of writing the characters comes from the Chinese uh, symbol uh, structures of the Chinese that we have studied in the past. The classic, classic curriculum dominated by Chinese, and we also have this thing called the Tale of Genji. Genji is a very long story written by a woman in the court of a Japanese emperor, and it tells the fake story of Genji, who is a fake uh, prince. What happens in the story is Genji and his friends basically live their lives doing normal court things. They have like uh, affairs, and they do lots of different strange things, and over time, the point of the story is that there's kind of like a sadness to the whole process, that as they grow older, they start to reminisce about times in the past. They really wish that they had uh, said things in, in certain situations. They wish they hadn't said things in certain situations. They also um, really emphasize the loss of friends, the loss of relationship, and it's kind of like a melancholy story that uh, kind of is something that a lot of us think about. What if and oh, if only they were still around. And so The Tale of Genji becomes one of the most uh, kind of well-respected early Japanese texts in literature in history. Institution of the Shogun. There is a civil war between the Tiara and Minamoto clans in the 12th century. Minamoto leader is named the Shogun, or military general leader, in 1185 CE. He ruled from the city of Kamakura, allowed the imperial throne to continue in Kyoto, again leaving the emperor to do his thing, and basically the shogun is in charge as a military and political leader. Then we get to medieval Japan, known as medieval Japan because it's kind of this uh, weird uh, time that kind of mirrors some of what we studied in uh, European history, or we're about to study in European history. Uh, they call it because it's an, a time between the Chinese influence and court domination, but uh, also the late uh, Tokugawa dynasty in the 16th century. And so we have the Kamakura and Muromachi periods. There is decentralized power in the hand of warlords. Again, when the centralized government is not doing the things that it needs, or when regional leaders decide that they can take on the imperial government without much strength, what they will do is decentralize the power and rule as regional kingdoms. Military authority is in the hands of the samurai, professional warriors that basically sit around all day, hang out, meditate, and stab people when they need to stab people. They are a really interesting class of people. Uh, as time goes on, the samurai gain lots of power within their specific regions, but over time they slowly lose it in the late 16th and in the uh, late 19th century. Uh, they slowly kind of go away. Uh, what's interesting is they do their own police, they do their own military, and the samurai kind of rule smaller parts of the regions all uh, pledging allegiance back to the Shogun Emperor. So we made it. You and you have finished studying this chapter should be able to do the following. Compare and contrast key features of the Sui, Ta'ong, and Sa'ong dynasties. Identify features of agricultural development in Ta'ong and Sa'ong China. Identify and discuss key technological and institutional developments during the Ta'ong and Sa'ong dynasties. Explain and discuss the emergence of the Chinese market economy. Outline and discuss the establishment of Buddhism and Neo-Confucianism in post-classical China. Compare and contrast the scope of Chinese influence in Japan, Vietnam, and Korea during the post-classical period, and identify and discuss important features of early and medieval Japan. Here's your writing assignment. Number one, the book refers to China by the Byzantine and Abbasid empires as political and economic anchors of the post-classical world. What does this phrase mean? What did all three of po the powers have in common? How do these factors contribute to their political and economic effectiveness? Number two. The Chinese population underwent rapid growth from 600 to 1200. What developments during this peri period promoted the growth? What were the economic advantages of having such a large population? What are the potential disadvantages? Number three, there were many foreign relations in China at this time, but Buddhism, excuse me, religions, foreign religions in China at this time, but Buddhism is the one that caught on. Why is that? What about Buddhism made it particularly appealing? How did it influence and blend with other belief systems at that time? How did its influence spread from China? As always, it has been great talking to you. It's time to go ahead and pick up your chapter, reread chapter 14. I will see you all back here again soon. Thanks for listening. Bye. What we do here is go back, 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 back.